I turn now to Monsieur Véron. You have the floor, my dear. Please. Thank you very much, and uh, particular thanks to uh, the World Policy Conference, uh, and especially Thierry and Song Nim for including me. Um, it's a particular privilege for me to be in this panel under the chairmanship of uh, Jean-Claude Trichet, who is also the honorary chairman of Bruegel. Uh, you mentioned uh, my affiliation there, uh, Jean-Claude. Uh, I also want to apologize for being another male panelist in an old male panel, uh, and uh, I am conscious of participating in a clearly suboptimal outcome here, but here we are. Um, the question is, uh, the, is the international economic order collapsing? Uh, and uh, I will uh, again uh, give, a, give another uh, attempt to answer this, and, and, and the answer is no. There is every reason to be concerned these days. I think we all have them in mind, and they have been uh, analyzed already uh, by a number of participants. Uh, there is uh, massive uncertainty. I think this is a dominant uh, characteristic of the current movement, that we don't know uh, a number of fundamental things, even in the very short term. And what happened in China in the last few weeks uh, was a, a reminder of that. Uh, there are some very uh, basic uh, premises of how we look at the world uh, that we cannot be completely sure of. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, climate change is a, a massive challenge. We're uh, losing the race against time in addressing it. So I'm not advocating complacency here, let me be very clear. But we don't see a collapse in sight of the order. I think the, the international economic order actually is surprisingly resilient. What happened this year? Uh, I was at the World Com uh, Policy Conference uh, last year. I was privileged to be uh, also here in Abu Dhabi at the other side of town. Uh, and uh, since then, extraordinary events have, uh, have been happening. Russia has invaded Ukraine. Um, the consequence has been Russia being isolated in the international system and to a large extent taken out of it. So uh, ring fence from the international economic system as opposed to this conflict leading to a collapse of the system. I think nobody put what the, the gist of what happened more eloquently than uh, actually two days before the invasion, uh, the Kenyan ambassador to the United Nations, Martin Kimani, uh, who, uh, as probably many of you remember, uh, made that point that what Russia was at the time threatening to do, the invasion of Ukraine, was an absolutely fundamental <coughs> challenge to all the norms that bind us together on this planet. And so the response, in terms of international economic institutions, has been forceful, but I would say proportionate, in terms of the extraordinary violation of norms that we have seen, and an extraordinarily forceful response. So let's uh, look at what I mean by resilience very quickly. The WTO, Mr. Pogam reminded us that uh, it's still there and running even after the aggression of the Trump administration. Uh, the G20, we had, to my mind, a very successful summit in Bali, which kind of illustrates what I'm talking about, including some strong wording in the final declaration compared to what I think everybody was uh, expecting. And I think the Indonesian presidency of the G20 uh, deserves a lot of credit for that. Um, the Bretton Woods institutions, uh, John Lipsky reminded us of the challenges and the need for the common framework uh, to make progress. That's, we're getting a li little bit into the weeds here, but, uh, but I think if you look at, for example, the restructuring of, uh, the announced restructuring of the debt of Zambia, we see uh, a possibility of some constructive evolutions, especially in the main challenge to the IMF these days, which is the interplay between Chinese lending to a number of uh, developing and emerging countries and the traditional framework embodied by the Paris Club. So I'm not saying the problem is resolved here. I'm just saying that the worst case scenarios are not materializing. The World Bank, it has been uh, mentioned by somebody in the audience, is still led by uh, uh, somebody who has uh, taken positions close to climate, deni climate change denial, but it remains a strong institution. Uh, let's talk about finance, because that's uh, the area I specialize in most. The Basel III Accord on Banking, um, Capital Requirements, Leverage, uh, Liquidity, and uh, Stress Testing has been an extraordinary international success. It's been 
implemented in a more globally consistent way than the previous accord of Basel II. Uh, sadly, the European Union is still not compliant, but most other ju jurisdictions are, and I think that has led to great resilience uh, in the financial system, in the banking system, as we have seen with the COVID-19 shock and with the shock of the Ukrainian uh, war. The Bank for International Settlements has, echoing what I was saying about the violation by Russia of international norms, for the first time that I'm aware of, applied international sanctions on Russia, one of its members, one of the members also of the Financial Stability Board, showing uh, the effectiveness of collective discipline in the system, I would argue. Uh, I'm not aware that the BIS had ever participated in international sanctions before, with the possible exception of uh, freezing the assets of the Central Bank of Yugoslavia, but that was after Yugoslavia no longer existed. We also have seen that challenges to the international economic and financial orders have not been very successful. Uh, I'm not going to expand on crypto, uh, these days, uh, we don't see either from Russia or China for in very different uh, environments attempts to, um, we don't see successful attempts to replace the basic infrastructure of the global financial system, payments, messaging, SWIFT, uh, uh, the um, uh, international uh, transaction settlement through CLS uh, group and, and uh, infrastructures of the same nature. And finally, as Gabriel has mentioned, we even have unprecedented progress, unfinished of course, uh, in an area which until now had been completely immune to that kind of collective cooperation, which is taxation with the efforts of the OECD. Uh, unfinished business to say the least, but the fact that this has even been possible to initiate uh, I think has to be taken as a step forward uh, that has happened under difficult circumstances. And of course, the EU, the European Union, which uh, I come from and which is the most advanced uh, exercise in uh, supranational economic and political cooperation, uh, has been built on rejection of economic nationalism with coal and steel in the first place. Uh, well, it has faced an existential crisis, but it has overcome it. Certainly, it has lost an important member, the United Kingdom, but uh, on many uh, parameters, it's now stronger uh, than ever. And we've seen that with the Next Generation EU a program of uh, borrowing and spending, which is the first time on this scale that the EU has been able to finance itself on its own uh, at the European level uh, with uh, redistribution against, uh, among its countries. So, uh, as I said, no complacency. Uh, we, need, uh, we don't need to replace this system, and I think that echoes what, what Chao Yide just said. China is not asking for the replacement of the system. It's uh, asking rightly for its reform and transformation. Um, I'm talking about the official discourse of China here. Uh, one thing I will say, there have been many ideas already uh, put forward for uh, reform, and uh, I'm not going to repeat things that have already been said. I will just say as a European, I think Europeans have to be proactive in creating space uh, for other jurisdictions in a changing world, maybe echoing what Aminata Toure was saying in the first panel. Uh, when you look at the things I focus most on, the BIS, the Basel Committee, the Financial Stability Board, Europeans are clearly massively overrepresented in that infrastructure. They, 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 there's absolutely no reason that in the Basel Committee you would have seven individual countries of the Euros <coughs> represented individually together with the ECB. So that has to change. Uh, Europeans need to take the initiative and uh, provide uh, for more balanced uh, representation, particularly of East Asia, but also of the Middle East, <coughs> Africa, and Latin America. Let me conclude on that. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, strong plea for the Europeans to be less numerous, <laughs> but as influential <laughs> as they are, but less numerous <coughs> in many uh, of these uh, groupings. 